that stand The peace you seek is not in that drink that's in your hand You will not find hope with that needle in your vein There is no life in the wicked lies that do your brain All you need is found in Jesus Surrender to the love of Jesus Put your faith in only Jesus Oh, only Jesus oh, Your future's not secured in all that money that you make True rest you will not find in the vacations that you take When will you ever learn that only God can give you rest? at its best All you need is found in Jesus Surrender to the love of Jesus Put your faith in only Jesus Oh Only Jesus Oh Only Jesus is the answer All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter uh, 1, verse 20? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. And uh, we're going to be uh, starting a new subject here this evening, which is kind of related uh, to uh, the last several subjects. We've studied the history of the English Bible, and we just finished last evening a study of uh, uh, canonicity. And now this evening we're going to be... Uh, those two subjects were in relation to bibliology, the study of the Bible, and this evening's subject uh, will be as well related to the subject of bibliology. Uh, it'll be the doctrine of inspiration. And so uh, I have you at 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Uh, we'll be looking at that briefly and in detail in subsequent classes in this subject. And also 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, we'll be looking at verse 16 here and 17 uh, this evening as well, very briefly. But we'll be looking, spending one night on uh, each of those passages because they relate to this subject of the, the doctrine of inspiration. So a uh, very, very important subject here. We're going to, uh, that we're, of course, it's related to the Bible. So, of course, if we're going to, we want the part of this, uh, this uh, study 
about uh, bibliology and these different subjects related to the Bible is to uh, build our confidence in the Scriptures and also help us to defend the, the, the Bible against the attacks from the, the, the naysayers or the opponents of the Bible. And there are many out there, very, many adversaries. So uh, it's to uh, prepare all of you for uh, uh, maybe uh, constant uh, confrontations that you might have in the, in the future and also obviously to build your, your confidence and strength in, in the Word of God that you can... Uh, trust in the Bible to govern your life, and uh, because that's what the Bible is uh, requiring of us, it wants to govern our lives, and and so it's a, a living book, it's a divine book, it's not just a book written by human beings. Uh, uh, human beings were involved in the process, but it was God who uh, uh, actually, as we will see this evening, provided the the inhale, and the uh, writers, human authors, exhaled God's will in writing. So this is a very very important subject like the previous one. And, uh, and then uh, following this subject of inspiration, we'll be doing uh, the doctrine of inerrancy, which is uh, related to the fact that there's no errors in the original autographs. And then related to that, after the Christmas break, when we come back, we'll do the basics of New Testament textual criticism. And basically how scholars look at the different copies of the New Testament and how they can determine uh, with a, a great degree of accuracy, the original autograph, even though we don't have the original autographs in our possession. And we'll be talking about why we probably don't have those original autographs in our possession. And of course, uh, so this, these are very critical subjects to, to understand and learn. I think if you uh, pay attention, you, you uh, apply yourself, uh, you'll get come away, I think, uh, being encouraged and strengthened in your faith. So uh, we'll, uh, let's take a moment of silent prayer. And uh, we take a moment to sign the prayer to examine ourselves, to determine if we are uh, in fellowship with, uh, to determine if we need to confess any sins to the Father. The confession of sin, of course, restores us to fellowship with God, and it also restores, of course, the filling of the Spirit when you're obeying what the Holy Spirit says to us in 1 John 1 9, like the rest of Scripture, which is inspired by the Holy Spirit. You're being influenced by the Holy Spirit, which is. Com uh, commanded of us in Ephesians 5.18. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit influences us when we obey His teaching in the Word of God, which He's inspired. So if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, uh, do what 1 Peter 5.7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening that we can gather together with other members of the body of Christ to study your word. We thank you for your people who are here in the Thompson household and also those who might be viewing or listening to this class right now live through our website or at a later date through the recordings on the website. We thank you for Titus and Jody Thompson's hospitality. And we just thank you, Father, for um, Titus's work with the sound and the recordings, the technology. We thank you for the technology. We thank you for the studies in the history of the English Bible and also the study we just completed with the doctrine of canonicity and now this subject of inspiration. We pray that you would work, uh, the Spirit would work through both the audience and the communicator mightily in this study. We pray that this study would be a blessing to your people and also bring glory to you and your Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, we just pray, Father, that, uh, uh, that you would help myself as the communicator, help me to uh, communicate, teach this subject accurately to your people and uh, so that your people are built up and edified spiritually, help your people through the ministry of the Spirit to learn this subject and to uh, apply it in their lives and apply it in their walk with you and, and to gain a greater confidence in the Bible and be able to defend it from the attacks of, of its enemies. And we just thank you, Father, for your people who have taken time out from their days and their busy work weeks 
and their families to study your word. We thank you for each and every one of them. So, Father, we pray for this service in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Just a quick reminder, we don't have class tomorrow evening. Uh, tomorrow evening, we do not have class because of Thanksgiving. And uh, we'll resume classes, of course, uh, Sunday. We'll be continuing our study of the, uh, Paul's epistle to the Colossians. Uh, we'll continue with our introduction to that particular book. And then we'll resume our classes during the week next Tuesday with this Doctrine of Inspiration. We'll pick up uh, with a second part second installment of this study of this important subject. Now, the term inspiration, like Trinity, is not a biblical word, but it does summarize some important facets of uh, biblical truth. The, the theological idea of inspiration presupposes a personal God with a mind and a sovereign will. This is extremely important to understand. Uh, God it does exist, and he has created us, and he seeks to communicate with us. And the doctrine of inspiration reveals to us that there is, in fact, a personal God. It presupposes a personal God. And we see that uh, who ha this God has a mind, and he has a will, and he's seeking to communicate that will to his people and to the human race. So the theological idea of inspiration presupposes a personal God with a mind and a sovereign will. So the Christian's conviction regarding the inspiration of the Bible is based upon the Bible's own testimony, or in other words, it's based upon explicit assertions in the, in the Scriptures. So one of them, and we've touched on this past passage many times in the past, and next week I believe we'll be doing it this verse in detail, these two verses, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, and we'll also be doing in detail 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Both are explicit, uh, uh, two passages that explicitly speak of the, uh, that God the Holy Spirit has uh, inspired the human authors of Scripture, is, uh, is the one who has moved them to write down what they did in the original languages of Scripture. So, uh, these two passages we'll look at in detail next week. Let's briefly just look at them here this evening. It says in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, say human volition, but rather men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So as I said before, the Christian's conviction regarding the inspiration of the Bible is based upon the Bible's own testimony, or in other words, it's based upon explicit assertions. The theological idea, of, as I said, of inspiration is that it presupposes a personal God with a mind and a sovereign will, and this is manifested in this passage. 2 Timothy, look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, which is going to be a very, a very um, interesting passage to look at in the original language. We're going to study it in detail when we, get to, when we study 2 Timothy after the first of the year. But uh, there's a lot of very interesting interpretive issues with these two verses, which we'll get into detail uh, next week, but not this, this evening. It says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God, and actually is in the Greek, there's only one word there, it actually means God breathe, all scripture is God breathe, and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man, or we could say the, the person of God, may be adequate, equipped for every good work. But notice again, who is behind scripture? It's God. And in particular, it's God the Holy Spirit. And we know that from other passages of Scripture, like 2 Second, Second, uh, Timothy, uh, Second Peter 1, 20 and 21. Now, J. Hampton Keithley III, who went home to be with the Lord uh, several years ago, he has the following comment, and I'm quoting from him. He says, As special revelation <clears throat> is God's communication to, man, to the man of truth, he must know an order, excuse me, a special revelation is God's communication to man of the truth he must know in order to be proper, properly related to God. So inspiration deals with the pre preservation of that revelation so that what was received from God was accurately transmitted to others beyond the original recipient. In Revelation, he says, we have the vertical reception of God's truth, while in inspiration, we have the horizontal communication of that revelation accurately to others. 
The question he says is, how can we be sure the Bible is God's revelation to man and not merely the product of human ingenuity or merely human opinion? If what God revealed has not been accurately recorded, then that record is subject to question. The doctrine of inspiration answers that question and guarantees the accuracy of the Bible as God's special revelation, end of quote. So notice what he said. In revelation, we have the vertical reception of God's truth, while in inspiration, we have the horizontal communication of that revelation accurately to others. So uh, we have uh, revelation is what the Bible is from God. Inspiration is how God used human beings to communicate his men to communicate with perfect accuracy in their original autographs that they wrote to whoever they were writing to God's people so revelation is vertical and men get it nobody's getting revelation from now all we're getting now because revelation is complete we know that with canonicity so all we're getting now if we get any insight in the scripture is insight illumination about the revelation that God has already given to us. So to technically speaking, revelation is what the Bible is. Inspiration is how God communicated this revelation through men to other people. So again, he says in revelation, we have the vertical reception of God's truth. While in inspiration, we have the horizontal communication of that revelation accurately to others. So Webster's Ninth New Collegiate Dictionary defines the word inspiration as, and I'm quoting from them, a divine influence or action on a person believed to qualify him to receive and communicate sacred revelation, the action or power of moving the intellect or emotions. Now, they state that the word inspire means to influence, move, or guide by divine or supernatural inspiration. So therefore, the, the, the theological definition that I'm going to give you of inspiration is going to be similar to other uh, definitions I'm going to give you from other men of God. Uh, mine, I think it, you'll, you can compare it, but it, I try to get with this definition, and I've learned it from others, is, and I can't remember where it actually re originates this definition, quite frankly, tell you the truth. Uh, so it come, it, it's, uh, what it does is it tries to explain in detail the whole process of inspiration. So by way of definition, the doc of, doctrine of inspiration contends that God the Holy Spirit so supernaturally directed or superintended the human authors of Scripture that without destroying their individuality, their literary style, their personal interest, and their vocabulary, God's complete and connected thought towards man was recorded with perfect accuracy in the original languages of Scripture. So uh, we don't want to we don't want to get into these ideas that uh, that uh, we don't want to get into these ideas that these guys lost their individuality when they wrote Scripture. They didn't lose their individuality. What they actually, excuse me for a second. They didn't lose their individuality. They were they maintain their personality, their likes, their dislikes, their intellect. And these men wrote down exactly what God wanted them to do and their own vocabulary and their own literary style. So uh, God didn't, uh, didn't coerce their volition. Uh, he didn't force them to write something down. Uh, he, they did it willingly. They were willing agents. And so, uh, and, 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 and not always was it dictation. There are some instances where, like Moses, uh, received directly from the Lord, and the Lord, he told, Lord told him to write it down like the law. But a lot of times, it had nothing to do with that. There was no dictation at, at all. So what we see here with this definition is we have, it, 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 with inspiration, we see that God provides the inhale, so to speak, and man exhales the will of God in writing. So uh, God, the Holy Spirit, blew into these men, God's will, and they exhaled it in writing. That's kind of a one way to, to describe it. So the Holy Spirit used people like Paul and Peter and Isaiah and Jonah, and they're all different backgrounds. Was it 40 different authors from different backgrounds? You have kings, fishermen, 
uh, you know, writing scripture. Uh, you have farmers writing scripture. You have uh, all types of people, all kings writing scripture, and all with different backgrounds, all with different vocabulary styles, all in different parts of time, different periods of history. And they didn't, God didn't change their, uh, them at all. They were just walking with God, and God used them as they were having fellowship with them. So he didn't destroy. The doctrine of inspiration means that God was able to supernaturally direct the human authors of Scripture without destroying their individuality or their literary style or their personal interests and their vocabulary. God's complete and connected thought towards men was recorded with perfect accuracy in the original language of Scripture. Not the king, any translation, but the original Hebrew and Aramaic of the Old Testament and the Greek New Testament. Now, very interesting. You talk about they didn't, uh, God didn't change their personal interests or likes and dislikes. Look at Jonah. But the book of Jonah, we see Jonah expressing his disdain for the, the people of Nineveh. Now, did God agree with that uh, assessment of Nineveh? No. God wanted to save those people in Nineveh. But God allowed Jonah to, to, uh, to communicate his view of the situation. And also at the same time, God was able to, to Jonah, communicate what he, uh, uh, his assessment of the Ninevites. So we can see that, uh, in, uh, and you see with uh, Solomon, Solomon in Ecclesiastes, he's writing a lot of things that were human viewpoint. God permitted him to write it down and supernaturally directed him to write this down because God was trying to communicate something through Solomon to the human race about life apart from him, which is vanity. So again, that's a little uh, um, example in scripture where God didn't, you know, you know, force any of the you know, writers like Jonah or Solomon to change their viewpoint of life or about a group of people. He permitted them and actually directed them and bringing that into play and writing it down. So in the original language of Scripture, we have contained the very uh, words of God, and therefore they bear the authority of divine authorship. That's why I, I, you hear me say, why do I make such a big thing about the Word of God? Why do I demand that when people are in front of me listening to the Word of God, that they're paying attention and not doodling or playing with their cell phones or anything? Because God is speaking. God is speaking through the Scriptures. So why are we, why are we doing anything but other than, other than concentrating what God is saying? If we believe that this book is inspired by God, we better pay attention to it. And so the, the scriptures and the original languages, they con convey the very words of God, and therefore they bear the authority of divine authorship. I wanted to get a, uh, a quote from, from an individual. See, give me a sec to find him. But um, let me find it, what I want to do. J.I. Pack, Packer, he's a great scholar. He's, he's got an interesting... Um, an interesting uh, um, comment. In fact, uh, yeah, it's a little bit. I, uh, there's another guy, Geisler, I wanted to quote from. But listen to what J.I. Packer has to say. He says, in formulating the biblical idea of inspiration, it's desirable that four negative points be made. And these are the ones I want to emphasize here. I'm going to try to check. What he's, basically what he's saying is what inspiration is not. Okay? So he says, number one, the idea of inspiration is not mechanical dictation or the automatic writing or any process which involved the suspending of the action of the human writer's mind. Such concepts of inspiration are found in the Talmud, Philo, and the Fathers, but not in the Bible. The divine direction and control under which the biblical authors wrote was not a physical or psychological force, and it did not detract uh, from, but rather heightened the freedom, spontaneity, and creativeness of their writing. Number two, he says, the fact that in inspiration, God did not obliterate the personality, the style, the outlook, and cultural conditioning of his penmen does not mean that his control of them was imperfect, or that they inevitably distorted the truth they had been given to convey in the process of writing it down. B.B. Warfield Gently, uh, let's, let's stop there. I don't want to continue with Warfield right there. We'll pick that up later. But um, 
he, uh, we see that, that those two points are very important. It wasn't mechanical dictation. He didn't, he didn't uh, overrun their personality, God. He let them be them. So when Paul wrote scripture, he wrote those letters. He was ready for, he was prepared by God to write those things down. And he was totally uh, under the influence of the Holy Spirit and willingly. And so Paul's, that's why when you look in scripture, the, you have different types of writing styles, different literary genres, genres and different, it's, the Bible is the greatest library. It's actually a library. And yes, it's a human book. We can't, we can't say it's not. It is very much a human book. And we have a certain language that is, it, it's language of the common people. And you see some language that is, uh, you would consider today, even outrageous or shocking in the Bible. And that's because God was using the language of men to communicate his will to all of us. So the doctrine of inspiration contends that God, the Holy Spirit, so supernaturally directed the human authors of Scripture that without destroying their individuality, their literary style, their personal interests, and their vocabulary, God's complete and connected thought towards man was recorded with perfect accuracy in the original languages of Scripture, and thus the original languages of Scripture contain the very words of God, and therefore they bear the authority of divine authorship. Uh, Linsell has the following comment. He writes, Inspiration carries with it the divine authority of God so that Scripture is binding upon the mind, the heart, and the conscience as the only rule of faith and practice for the believer. In its authority, Scripture stands above men, creeds, and the church itself. All of them are subject to Scripture, and any authority that any one of them may exert is valid insofar as it can be supported by Scripture, end of quote. So you tie this into what happened when we studied the history of the English Bible and the Reformation. Uh, we saw that the Roman Catholic Church was saying they're the final authority. Luther and Calvin came along, the, the Reformers, and they, which spawned Protestantism in protest to Roman Catholicism. Protestantism, like the Luther and Cal Calvin, the Reformers, and Wycliffe or uh, uh, John William Tyndale, they all said, wait a minute, the Bible is the final authority. And I love that quote where he says, uh, Linsell says, all of them are subject to Scripture. And any authority that any one of them may exert is valid insofar as it can be supported from Scripture, end of quote. So uh, my authority, any authority I have, has got to be from the Bible. The minute I get off track, I don't have any authority anymore. Whatever I teach, whatever I do, whatever our policies in this church have got to be governed by the Scripture. And you have every right to say no if what I do is not biblical. And you can show that it's not biblical. Then you have no right. To, you should not, in all conscience, reject what I say or do. But if I, what I'm saying is supported by Scripture, it's binding on you. You're now on your, your mind, your will, your conscience, and it, because God is speaking. So we don't, what the Reformers did is they said to the, church, the Catholic Church, you don't have any authority only when you're operating in the authority that God has delegated to you and as you interpret and apply accurately the Word of God. The minute you make up your own rules and have rules that are, and things you tell people to do that are not supported by Scripture, you lose your authority. This is the fight that Jesus had with the Pharisees and the scribes. They had their little traditions, human man-made traditions, and that's legalism. And they used those man-made traditions to get around obeying what the original languages say. So that's why Jesus condemned them. You know, you say... You don't, you don't do what the scriptures say, honor your father and mother. You take a gift and you give it to the temple and you don't give it and say it's given to God as a gift, yet you don't, your, your parents in need and you don't take care of your parents. So the, what comes priority as the priority is obeying the word of God and honoring your mother and father and taking care of them if they're in need. But the Pharisees would go right around the scriptures and there's reasons of that and we'll, 
We'll study that in the future someday when we get to that book or uh, we study something related to it. So this is very important we have here. Our final authority is Scripture. And, uh, and listen to me. And, you know, you talk about the Roman Catholic Church as uh, basically saying they're the final authority. And the reform is saying you don't have any authority only unless you're operating in the authority that's been delegated to you by God or you're, you have that authority where you're, what you're doing is in obedience to the Word of God. You don't have any authority outside of Scripture. Well, there are some pastors, evangelical pastors, who say things from the pulpit in their congregations they they just they're like they're listening. It's like I'm in the Catholic Church, and they listen to what the pastor says, and they just nod whatever he says, and they parrot what he says. But they don't really understand. They don't really have it as their conviction, and they're just blindly listening and obeying what that guy says, and not being uh, active listeners and checking out what he has to say. So I give you chapter and verse. I explain myself why I might change a translation. And I do that because I don't want you to sit there and go, you know, whatever Pastor Bill says, you know. And I, so what we have to say to ourselves is, you know, we have a responsibility, I have a responsibility, and my responsibility is to communicate accurately the Word of God and obey it myself. And when I do that, communicate it accurately, it's binding on you. You are now responsible for it. You're not responsible to obey false doctrine or some guy's fantasy, uh, you know, uh, his uh, imaginations that he communicates to his congregation. There's a lot of things I hear that are uh, and from pulpits. They go through on the internet. You listen to some of these guys who are so-called pastors, and you wonder where, you know, they get a passage of Scripture. They're not even interpreted. They go off on a tangent on something that's not even has anything to do with the passage. And they just go ranting and raving about some political thing. It's usually against the president, uh, you know, Obama or something. They're all these they, put, they right-wing stuff, and it has nothing to do with the Word of God. They talk about, there's one guy, I don't know why people listen to this guy, all he does is talk about history of the American government or the Constitution. How about teaching the Bible? That's what you're there for. You want to teach American history, then go to college and teach American history. But when you're in front of God's people, you teach them the Word of God. But, you know, the, the, you know you, you, that would, que- I would make me question whether this guy even had the gift. You, you're not even in the Scriptures, you're on the the American Constitution? What's the, what's the deal with that? So you got to start, you know, we got we to start thinking of these things about authority, and authority is in the Scriptures. And if we don't, if I don't interpret, or any pastor doesn't interpret the Scripture accurately and properly, you have no right, you don't have to listen to that. You don't have to, you can listen to it, but you don't have to obey it. You don't have to agree with it. So uh, I, I remember one time, uh, there was some, it was some particular subject and some pastor was teaching and I, I didn't agree with it, you know, and I had good reason, but the, you know, the, you know, the, the pastor didn't like the fact that I, I didn't agree with him. I wasn't a jerk about it. I just, you know, just, I can't, I, I just can't, uh, adhere to that. I have a problem with that and his why, but you know, the, the guy tried to hammer me down. It's like, that's not right that you have to browbeat me. And, uh, you know, and try to uh, bully me into believing something I can't believe. You know, so that's not right. And the reason why the person bu- bullied me is because they're not sure of themselves. Otherwise, they wouldn't be trying to bully me. They'd be trying to be, you know, trying to communicate it and trying to uh, communicate it so I could understand. Instead, they were bullying me. So that's not right. And the reason, so that person's, not, that past is not operating in the authority of the word of God, he's doing it on his own. What he's doing is, is his own authority or his own power, not God's power and God's authority. So the minute we deviate from scripture, we're in trouble. So we see that uh, the original languages of scripture contain the very words of God and therefore bear the authority of divine authorship. Consequently, there are three sub- reasonable suppositions that we can derive from this statement. One, since God is a person, <clears throat> excuse me, since God is a person, perfect, eternal, infinite, and just, he will always have a message to give, and he will always reveal it so it could be understood by any person, any believer. Number two, the divine record and revelation will be given in accurate, accurate terms, excuse me, accuracy and inerrancy. Number three, the text of this record will be preserved in its purity by God himself and will therefore be indestructible. 
God sees to that. Thus, one can say that the Bible, in its original languages, is the exact record, the mind, and will of God. Inspiration guarantees a couple of things. Number one, the accuracy of Satan's lies and, that they, that, and the way that they were phrased. That doesn't mean that God agrees with it or it was God's will what Satan said, and only in the sense that God, uh, his permissive will, and permitted Satan to say. But when we look at uh, Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, Ezekiel 28, 12 through 19, those passages are giving us, God's letting us, uh, through those prophets, the Holy Spirit's conveying to us what was Satan's rebellion like in eternity past. None of us human beings were around then. The angels were around. And some of the things that went on in Satan's mind that no other angel could see, only God, God communicated to us in those passages. So inspiration guarantees the accuracy of Satan's lies and the way that they were phrased. It, you could also say this, it guarantees the accuracy of the creation, or we could call it the crea creation chaos restoration account. Number two, inspiration guarantees the way people committed their sins. We can be sure that the way David sinned with Bathsheba is accurate. We got the accurate story. Or Peter denying the Lord three times. Or Judas Iscariot betraying the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. All of that, we can be sure is accurate, and so because inspiration guarantees that. The Holy Spirit direct, directed the human authors of Scripture to communicate these sins and the way they were they committed with perfect accuracy to us. Number three, inspiration guarantees that anything, anything that is not related to the plan of God and outside the plan of God is recorded for a purpose and for a reason. Now, the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy with exposition states, number one, God, who is himself truth and speaks truth only, has inspired Holy Scripture and ordered thereby, thereby to reveal himself to lost mankind through Jesus Christ as creator, Lord, redeemer, and judge. Holy Scripture is God's witness to himself. Remember that. Holy Scripture is God's witness to himself. They also go on to say, number two, Holy Scripture being God's own word, written by men, prepared and superintended by his spirit, is of infallible divine authority in all matters upon which it touches. It is to be believed as God's instruction in all that it affirms, obeyed as God's command in all that it requires, embraced as God's pledge in all that it promises. Number three, they say that the Holy Spirit, Scripture's divine author, both authenticates it to us by his inward witness and opens our minds to understand its meaning. Number four, being holy and verbally given, God, a God given, scripture is without error or fault in all its teaching, no less in what it states about God's acts and creation, about the events of world history, and about its own literary origins under God, than in its witness to God's saving grace and individual lives. And then lastly, number five, they say, the authority of Scripture is inescapably impaired if this total divine inerrancy is in any way limited or disregarded or made relative to a view of truth contrary to the Bible's own. And such lapses bring serious loss to both the individual and the church, end of quote. Dr. Charles Ryrie, he states that inspiration as God's superintendence of the human authors so that using their own individual personalities, they composed and recorded without error in his revelation to man in the words of the original autographs. Several features of the definition are worth emphasizing, he says. One, God superintended but did not dictate the material. Number two, he used human beings, human authors, and their own individual styles. And number three, Nevertheless, the product was, in its original manuscripts, without error. End of quote. Another great scholar, Edward J. Young, says, Inspiration is a superintendence of God the Holy Spirit over the writers of the scriptures, as a result of which these scriptures possess divine authority and trustworthiness, and possessing such divine authority and trustworthiness are free from error. End of quote. Millard Erickson, Millard J. Erickson, another scholar, he writes, by inspiration of the scripture, we mean that supernatural influence of the Holy Spirit 
upon the scripture writers which rendered their writings an accurate record of the revelation or which resulted in what they wrote actually being the word of God, end of quote. So if the doctrine of inspiration, when we understand it, it has significant implications for the human race. And if we're already believers in Jesus Christ, it has humongous implications. It means that everything that we do must be governed by the word of God. The word of God, we're to submit to its authority. The doctrine of the, one of the great implications for the church of the doctrine of inspiration is we are bound to obey what it says. So if it says, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church, you better do that. If it says, wives, obey your husbands in all things as in the Lord, wives, you better do that. Uh, 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 you Christian children, obey your parents in all things as in the Lord. Do that. God is speaking to all of us, each group, husbands, wives, parents, children, and slaves, you know, obey your masters in all things as unto the Lord, and masters be just and kind and, uh, uh, and give justice to your, your slaves. You know, so Christian labor, we could say today, and Christian laborers, we're supposed to do our work for our bosses as unto the Lord, and Christian bosses, you're to treat the people in, in your business with respect and justice, not cheating them out of money. So all the by that all because of the, the doctrine of inspiration, the implication is we're bound to we're we're obligated to obey what it has to say. And here's another thing: we're also obligated to learn it. If this is God's, if the Bible is inspired by God, and it is. And it gives evidence to this, such as fulfilled prophecy. And we studied a lot in Daniel of fulfilled prophecy. We, we are obligated and we're, we're commanded to learn this. We're to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the doctrine of inspiration is putting pressure on us. God's confronting us with this doctrine. And if it, this book is inspired by him, then we, are, we should listen to it. We should have reverence for it. We should respect it. And we should, we should learn it and apply it in our daily lives. And it will do a great work in our lives. The payoff is we'll get the joy of the Lord. The Holy Spirit will reproduce his, his joy in our lives. He will give us wisdom, the know-how to do everything in life that we need to do to make us a success in his eyes, to give us the will of God and so we can receive rewards at the Bema seat, to bring glory to him, to grow up to be like Christ. Everything has to do with our attitude towards Scripture. So I believe that this book is inspired by God. And I believe that, and that's why I've dedicated my life to that, my whole adult life is to this book. And I wouldn't do that if I didn't think the book was inspired by God. And if I didn't have evidence for it. So I try to convey that to you, that if you're smart, especially young people, if you're smart, never, ever, ever deviate from this book. Ne learn, learn, become a student, fall in love with it. It's the greatest book. It's God. It's, God is expressing himself in, this, in the Bible. God is expressing himself. He's talking to you and I. And wherever you're at spiritually, he can talk to you there. I mean, if God could create you and then save you through his son, I think he can talk to each one of us and deal with our particular problems through his word. I believe that the Bible is inspired by God. Therefore, I believe that scripture is sufficient to handle all of our problems. I believe it can handle any marriage problem. I believe it can handle any mental problem or psychological problem that we have. I mean, gee, I, I, I was a nut when I was a kid. When I was Tyler's late age, I was a whack job. My mother was, when I dated, I told you this, when I dated a psychologist one time in my mid-20s, she said, good, you can get, finally get some help. You know? And, but the Bible, when I started studying it, started trying to practice it in my life, I started seeing a change in my attitude. Little by little, the more I got involved in it, the more I got more, I got more peace and, and, and contentment and I, I had a direction in life. It, it, God gave me a purpose all through his word. And so the, when I say this, when I talk about 
how important the word of God is to us, and I say it and I communicate how important it is to me, I really mean that. I mean, I'm telling you that this book is, could handle any problem you have. It doesn't matter what it is. Self-esteem issues, you, you know, you don't need booze or alcohol or a pill. And that doesn't mean, I know some people have problems that are biological related and can affect their way they think, their brain, everything. I understand that. I'm not saying drop your medication. But there are some things that people take that they don't need. Really, actually, well, all they need is the word of God. They don't need a pill. They don't need a drug. They don't need alcohol. They don't need sex. They don't need a husband or a wife. They don't need kids. God can solve their problems. So it's exciting to know through this doctrine of inspiration, it's telling me God is speaking to me in this book. And if this book is a textbook on how to live. And it tells you, there's so many things about it. It tells you the future. I always wanted to know a future. Now I know the future, what the Bible says about the future. I know what's going to happen on this earth. And it helps me interpret what's going on today in the world and what's going on in society. You know, the Bible tells me that this world is, con- is, con- is a condemned world governed by sin and Satan. And I can understand why they're marching in the streets throughout America. You know, we got, we're, 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 God tells us what, what the human race is all about. It tells us what's going on, on the earth, what's happening. This world is deceived. It also tells me God's attitude toward all of us, the human race. The word of God says, God, I love the world despite the fact that they've fallen and oppose me and are my enemies and treat me like an enemy and mistreat me and speak evil of me. I still sent my son to the cross to, for all these people. I give them grace. I give them a pardon through faith in my son. The word of God is the most important thing. Make it the most important thing in your life. And listen to me. We're not worshiping the book, so to speak. We're worshiping the God that the book speaks about. So, the definitions of inspiration that I read to you, presented above, that I just mentioned, they speak both of God's action by his spirit and the human author and of the nature of the resulting text. Let me repeat that. These definitions, including my own, presented, they speak both of God's actions by his spirit and the human author and of the nature of the resulting text. Therefore, the scripture states, as we said, it was it say in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 that I read from the New American Standard, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Furthermore, the scriptures teach that not only are the human authors of scripture carried along by the Holy Spirit or influenced by the Holy Spirit, but the resulting scripture is God-breathed. Uh, in 2 Timothy 3.16 that we read, the phrase, the, the, what does it say in 2 Timothy 3.16? You don't have to turn to it. I'll just read it for you. All scripture is, is inspired by God. In the, in the original text, it means all scripture God-breathed. It's elliptical uh, because it's ed- for emphasis. All scripture is God-breathed. So whatever the writer put down in writing in the original, in the Bible, in the original autographs, it was God breathed. God pr- provided the inhale for the human authors of Scripture, and they exhaled God's will in writing. So they were influenced by the Holy Spirit. So this is what we have for the doctrine of inspiration. Now notice in these passages that we just read, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and uh, 17. Notice that these passages teach that it is Scripture that is so described, not the human author. If we choose to use the word inspired or instead of God breathed, then we can say that it is the text that is inspired, not the human authors. Now, if we use the term inspire to the fact that the human authors were carried along by the Holy Spirit, then the authors of Scripture were in fact inspired. So therefore, our definition of inspiration is designed to both capture both the work of the Holy Spirit through the human author and the resulting status of the text of Scripture. It is important to understand, people, that there is nothing in this definition that requires a particular mode of inspiration. What I mean is that the scriptures reveal that inspiration may operate through a vision or a trance-like dream, as we saw with, in Daniel's book, and hearing voices. We, uh, you know, uh, was it Samuel 
You know, he's a little boy, and, and, the, and he's, in, he's in bed. I love that story. And Samuel. <laughs> and he goes, yeah. You know, he gets up, but he thinks uh, uh, the, the high priest is, uh, is um, actually calling him. And he's like, and happened a couple of times. He's going to go, go, go back to bed. The next time the voice talks to you, say, uh, here I am, Lord. What can I do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And so he did, and that's how he meets the Lord. So the, when we talk about the uh, inspirations, the scriptures reveal that inspiration may operate through a vision. We saw that in the book of Daniel. Or a trance-like state, or a trance-like dream as we saw with Daniel, or hearing voices like we saw with Samuel. So, however, we must also keep in mind that there is nothing in the definition that I gave you of, of uh, inspiration that requires such phenomena. In fact, the scriptures also reveal that it is not clear that all of the biblical writers were always self-consciously aware that they were writing uh, scripture or that their writing was canonical scripture. Uh, look at First Peter, I believe it is. Look at First Peter. I think we studied this in Daniel. Look at First Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 10. First Peter 1.10, as to this salvation that he's been talking about in the previous verses, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, Old Testament prophets, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. And it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. And these things, which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So he's basically saying they were, looked into, they were trying to figure out, uh, get some insight into what they were prophesying about. They didn't always know what they were prophesying about or how it would come to pass. And we saw this in the book of Daniel. You know, did Daniel know everything about what would take place? He, he knew what was given to him, but he didn't know the Roman, about the Roman Empire. I mean, he, he knew there was an empire that we know was going to be Rome, but he didn't know the name Rome or, you know, or Greece or something like that. He didn't know the, 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 uh, the names of these empires, so to speak, always. Uh, he knew Medo-Persia because that was right in his lifetime. But did he know about Alexander's Greece? No, in Daniel's day, it was a small uh, group of city-states. And he didn't, and Rome was a, was a bunch of, you know, wasn't, wasn't anything either. It was just that little place of Italy. So, you know, Daniel, you know, he had these things, but he didn't understand everything that he prophesied about. We do, because we're on the other side, you know? The cross has come, Christ has come, the resurrection, and the t- we're in the end times now because of the Christ's death and resurrection. So we, we know more about what Daniel wrote than Daniel when he wrote it. So this is very important to understand. So we see that the scriptures, when we talk about the doctrine of inspiration, we know that the scriptures reveal that it's not clear in, that all of the biblical writers were always self-consciously aware that what they were writing was canonical scripture or what they were writing, what it meant, or they understood what, what it meant. So the term inspiration is really not much more than a convenient label to attach to the process whereby God has brought about the existence of the scriptures, verbal in- revelation and historical witness, words of human beings and words of God, the truth that God chose to communicate, and in particular, the forms of individual human authors. Now, I want to finish with a couple of quotes. J. Hampton Keithley writes, inspiration must be carefully defined because of the varied uses of this term and the wrong ideas about inspiration being promoted today. Ideas that are inconsistent with what the Bible itself teaches regarding inspiration. He says, inspiration may be defined as God's superintendence of the human authors of Scripture so that using their own individual personalities, they composed and recorded without error his revelation to man and the words of the original autographs. If we break this definition down into its various parts, we note several elements. Listen carefully to what he says. He says, each of which is vital to understanding what the Bible teaches about inspiration. Number one, the word superintendence. I use the word directed. The word superintendence refers to the guiding relationships God had with the human authors of Scripture in the various material of the Bible. 
His superintendence varied in degree, he says, but it was always included so that the Spirit of God guaranteed the accuracy of what was written. Number two, Heathley says the word composed shows that the writers were not simply stenographers who wrote what God dictated to them. They were actively involved using their own personalities, backgrounds, and God's working in their lives. But again, what was composed had the superintendence of God over the material written. Number three, without error, expresses what the Bible itself claims to be true regarding its record. It's God's word and the word is truth. If God's word is truth, like it says in John 17, 17 and Psalm 119, 160, that means it's without error. He goes on to say, number four, though our translations of the Bible are tremendously accurate, being based on thousands of manuscript witnesses, inspiration can only be ascribed to the original autographs, not to manuscript copies or the translations based on those copies, end of quote. So that means the King James is not inspired by God. Why the King James crowd, only crowd, do this? They actually use much of the scriptures that we use to talk about inspiration and to defend the, the, uh, the inspiration of the Bible. And they take those passages and apply them to the King James. King James, when those passages are related to the original autographs, well before the King James was ever translated. You know, the King James, as we saw in the history of the English Bible, has gone through a number of revisions. I can't remember how many there were. But this is all documented. It's not my opinion, or I'm not having an axe to grind with the King James. I think it was a beautiful English translation, and it had a huge impact on uh, our culture in the past. But it's not inspired by God. So the doctrine of inspiration applies only to the original autographs of Scripture. So that means no English translation is inspired by God. It can't be. Only the inspiration only applies to the scripture, the original autographs. Now, a man named Enns, another scholar, he says the following, and we'll end with his quote, there are several important elements that belong in a proper definition of inspiration. Number one, the divine element, God the Holy Spirit superintended the writers, ensuring the accuracy of the writing. Number two, the human element, human authors wrote according to their individual styles and personalities. Number three, the result of the divine human authorship is the recording of God's truth without error. That's inerrancy. Number four, inspiration extends to the selection of words by the writers. And number five, inspiration relates to the original manuscripts, end of quote. So tonight was a definition and an introduction to the subject of inspiration. That's why I quoted, I went through so many definitions and I wanted to get a, a number of different scholars in there. To uh, sh which uh, sh support what I've been giving you as a definition about inspiration. It's kind of interesting when I did my when I got my ordination and I was doing the uh, we did the written or, uh, thing, written uh, exam, and then uh, there was an oral examination uh, by pastors and different guys who were seminary guys or whatever, and uh, they uh, deacons and stuff, and so they you know they 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 pummeled me and Jim with questions about different things and. We were prepared for the questions. Some questions we, you know, we didn't know what they were going to ask. And one of the questions I had was inspiration. Give me a, def a definition for doctrine of inspiration. I was like, ooh, that was good. And I just whipped it off. You know, God's the Holy Spirit so supernaturally uh, directed the human authors of Scripture without changing their literary styles or destroying their volition or coercing their vo volition or, or changing their personal interests or their vocabulary. God's complete connected thought to mankind was recorded with perfect accuracy in the original autographs of Scripture. Therefore, the original autograph bears the authority of God and the very words of God. And that, that, that definition, remember that definition. You can, if, you can, uh, if you can memorize it or come close to memorizing that, you could do it. If I could do it, I'm not too... You're laughing because you're like, Bill, you're crazy. Look at If I could do it and I don't have... My, my, my IQ is just a little bit over room temperature maybe. And uh, if I could do it, anybody... We get a lot of straight-age students in here, so we could, they, they could do that. If they could memorize these math definitions and all this other stuff, trigonometry or whatever he's learning over there, you could do the doctrine of inspiration. But this is what you need to know, all, all kidding aside. It's a divine and human book. It's, yeah, it's, you can't say... You've got to be careful. You can't say that it's not a human book. Oh, it's human all the way. 
there's, it's so human, but at the same time, it's a divine book because it has a supernatural character to it, such as we know this through fulfilled prophecy. All the fulfilled prophecy means this book, the Bible, is not just any old human book. It's more than a human book. It's divine because human beings can't predict the future hundreds and hundreds and years and thousands of years before it takes place. Uh, you know, they couldn't predict Jesus of Nazareth. Human beings could not, never in a million years, they can't even predict the weather. They can't even predict, the, you know, they try to predict the, the future. They can't do it. But the Bible does. The Bible, and, and the, it's interesting, and the human authors of Scripture will always point us to God. God has told me this. They're not giving glory to themselves because they know that these human authors of Scripture know the prophets of Israel such as, they know that what they was given to them was from God and is not human of, not of human origin, as we saw in that, what Peter says. It's, you know, no script, prophecy of Scripture is of a man's own interpretation, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So God, if God, cre- it's not so big of a deal. I mean, if God could create the universe, the time, matter, space continuum, I mean, is it such a big deal that God could inspire guys to write down with perfect accuracy, his will to people? I mean, what's that a big deal? If God be- could become a man, I mean, is, is it a big deal that God could inspire, you know, move these guys to write down exactly what he, wa- they, he wanted them to write down without coercing their volition? I think that shows you the, the, the great wisdom and power of God, this whole doctrine of inspiration. It's in the so- obviously the sovereignty of God. So it's really... Uh, my prayer is that this subject like the canonicity in the history of the English Bible will answer some questions and help us to give us uh, some ammo to fight the enemies of the Christianity in the Bible, but also cause us to become even more dedicated to this book which reveals such wonderful God that we have. So let's close in prayer. And remember, we have no class tomorrow. Uh, we have Thanksgiving tomorrow, so let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word and this subject of inspiration. We pray that this last hour would have been a blessing to your people and help your people understand this subject. And if some people uh, have trouble uh, with some of the things, that they would be patient, that you would uh, help them and, and guide them, and that uh, eventually they'll get uh, understanding with regards to this subject if they're confused on some things, or later on in these studies of this subject, they would get some answers and clarification on some of the things we talked about this evening. So in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.